All right. So the music has stopped, which means it is probably time for me to start talking. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, we got a thumbs up from our speakers. So I'm going to go ahead and get going with this introduction. So Bojo, welcome everyone. Bojo Jayek. Um, I would just love to welcome everybody to this very special aviation roundtable discussion. Uh, we look forward to hearing from Paul, uh, who is a current scholarship recipient, and just talk to them about their journey in the aviation field. As you probably already noticed, we'll be recording today's session. So we thank you for uh, helping us make this a very special session. And uh, we're going to keep everybody's mic muted, uh, except for the current speaker, but there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, so be sure to use that raise hand feature or put it in the chat and we'll be uh, moderating that chat box so that we can uh, get some questions for Paul whenever the time comes. Uh, if you're like me, you will have that moment after we close the call and you'll be like, oh, I should have asked this. If you have that moment, fear not, uh, just email us at education at Potawatomi.org or you can just give us a phone call at 405-695-6028. And whatever your questions are, we can pass those along to make sure that uh, Paul gets them and we can uh, get you excited and interested in aviation. So with that, we're going to do a brief introduction of our education team. Um, so I'm going to let Tasha, our director, kick it off. Bojo Jayek, Chajakwe Anishinaabe No Swin, Tasha Zintek, Indejnikas, Shawnee, Oklahoma, Indochpia, Oklahoma City, Adayan, Mako, Indodem, Shishi Beni, and Bandagwes. So hello, everybody. My English name is Tasha Zentek. I am originally from Shawnee, Oklahoma, but I live in Oklahoma City now, and I have the extreme honor of serving as education director for my tribe, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. So, um, you know, our, our mission as a department is to uh, help prepare for the next seven generations by um, helping tribal citizens identify and achieve their learning goals. And so we do that in a variety of ways that you'll hear just brief snippets about here in a moment. But, but my role in the department is really just to, to make sure we adhere to that mission and make sure our team has everything that, they, that we need to um, serve our tribal citizens. So a pleasure to be with you all here today. And um, I'll pass it over to Charles. Miigwech. All right. OCO, Charles Lee Dagwadoa. So as you may have noticed I am the odd man out. I am the Cherokee citizen folk here, but I'm very, very uh, privileged and honored to be able to serve as your assistant director of the Department of Education here with the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. So uh, yeah, just, just like Tasha said, we're, we're here to, to help students out. Um, namely, I take care of students with the last names that begin with A through M. Uh, our other college advisor, Rachel Watson, is presenting you know, at a conference today. So unfortunately, they're not gonna be able to, hear, uh, to be here to introduce themselves, uh, but they take care of the latter half of the alphabet in through Z. So uh, if you ever need anything, definitely feel free to give us a shout. Kim? Hi, um, my name is Kim Ko. I just recently joined the team about two months ago, but I've been with the tribe for four years. And um, I am not Potawatomi, but I'm married. My husband is Potawatomi, so it's been wonderful working for the tribe and learning all the different things. Um, I am the internship and project coordinator for us. Thank you, Kim. So uh, we're just going to do a few department updates and uh, policy announcements, and then we're just going to uh, um, give an intro to Paul and get, get going with this. So um, about the scholarship. Uh, the deadline for the fall 2022 has passed, uh, but you know, for any folks who are watching this who are scholarship recipients, the spring scholarship opens on November 15th and closes on February 15th. Uh, as always, you apply for that online uh, on our portal, which is portal.potawatomi.org. Uh, and if you ever have questions, give us a shout. That's me again, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to give a little update on interns. Um, we have three that are working. They started in August and we'll finish up this semester. 
And then the spring semester, if you are interested, um, the application is open until November 10th, um, and then they'll intern starting after the new year. And then what I'm really excited about is I will be heading up the Indominin um, program this year. I know Paul's an alumni of that, and um, the application for that has opened and will be available through November 15th. Um, if you're not familiar with that, um, we are it's seven weeks, um, and each week explains a little bit more about CPN and the different enterprises here and what all it entails um, here. So, all right, and as always, the I mentioned that I take care of the first half of the alphabet. Rachel takes care of the latter half. So what I mean by that is we offer individualized advising uh, for any education questions or resume building. Uh, you know, higher education is definitely an overwhelming uh, world, uh, which we are trying to remove some of that uh, nervousness and anxiety that surrounds higher education and make it approachable for everybody. So that is kind of what our job is. So uh, you can definitely schedule an appointment through Zoom, phone call, email, text, whatever your comfort level, we will meet you where you are. You can schedule those by giving us a phone call. Again, our phone number is 405-695-6028. You can email us at education at potawatomi.org, or we have an online advising and scheduling tool that's found on our portal, so portal.potawatomi.org. <laughs> Also, for anybody who is graduating uh, <clears throat> either summer 2022, fall 2022, or spring 2023, uh, so this fall or next spring, or if you graduated this past <clears throat> summer, please fill out our graduation celebration uh, application, which is also found on the portal. We really try to make that a one-stop shop for everything that we offer. If you're able to join us in person, we are going to have a luncheon the last Saturday of April. But if you can't join us, please fill out the virtual application. Uh, we have a virtual commencement that we post on the tribe's Facebook pages, uh, also on their YouTube channel. And we definitely wanna honor you and your achievements, uh, regardless of what level of graduation, high school, Bowtech, associates, bachelors, all the way up to doctorate. So please fill that out. Uh, you'll also receive a gift uh, to honor your achievement. So we definitely want to uh, bring honor to you. So, Tasha. All right, Miigwech, Charles and Kim. So I am just extremely excited to be able to introduce Paul Lins to you. So he does it all. He's a doctoral candidate. He is a Ndaman alum, which Kim spoke about that program. He's an active Shkodadeyajik uh, American Indian Science and Engineering Society or ACES member <clears throat> and he is our featured guest for today. So really excited to have him. <clears throat> Paul reached out, gosh, um, a few years ago and just you know wanted to know how he could contribute to the tribe and just be involved. And he really has you know followed through with that. And that's really, that's what we hope for our students to do. We hope that they get excited about who they are as Potawatomi people. And it has been just a joy to watch um, Paul and his journey and to learn about the things that he was already doing to um, you know help minorities enter this field. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Paul and then we'll turn it over to, uh, to him. He's going to give a brief presentation and then really the bulk of today's uh, session, we want to have questions and answers. We know that it's always hard to find a time of day that meets everybody's schedules. So we are recording this and you know, we'll ask as many questions that we think others might have so that this will be available if you're watching this after the fact too. So. Uh, Paul Wins is a Citizen Potawatomi Nation member from San Diego, California, who hails originally from the Bergeron family. He is a second generation veteran, following in the footsteps of his father, Carl, who was an enlisted US Navy chief. And he, as a young child, made the journey from Oklahoma to California during the Dust Bowl. Paul has worked in aviation and aerospace for his entire life, starting as a Navy S3B Viking pilot, then working as a program manager at Boeing Defense during his civilian career. And now he's an entrepreneur and he's training the next generation of pilots at Lex Air, a flight school based in California and Kansas. He's a lifelong learner, loves academic world, and he's currently enrolled at the University of California, San Diego, Brady School of Management as a PhD student. 
and with scholarship for support from the Citizen Potawatomi Nation Department of Education. And so with that, I will turn it over to Paul. And I just want to make a note here because, because I recognize the names that are on the call. Of course, we you know, have someone that you're familiar with, Paul, but also um, wanted to give a welcome to Julie McCormick, who is the superintendent of Gordon Cooper Technology Center, which is our local career tech school. Um, and I'm really happy to have representation um, for, uh, from you, Julie, uh, on this call today too. So that's, that's really wonderful. So Paul, I'm gonna hand it over to you, miigwech. Miigwech, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and the kind words. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, and uh, yeah, let, let me just launch into it here, both for the folks that are here live, uh, and as well as the uh, folks in video land who are gonna watch this a little bit later. So I will start tonight by answering the question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds, hopefully everyone's mind, is why become a pilot? Well, one answer is more are needed than ever before. Hundreds of thousands of new pilots are going to need to be hired in just the next five years alone. And the pay and the benefits for becoming a professional pilot are on par with, with doctors, lawyers, engineers, um, you name it. it, it the, this is one of the most competitive pay careers um, uh, anywhere. Entry-level pay is up by 70% by just this year, and salaries were up 50% in 2019, even ahead of the labor shortages that we saw during the pandemic. Overall, airline pay is up 150% just in the past four years. So with all of that, you, you might think that, that there are more pilots than ever before, and that's just not true. Um, new pilots are not coming into this career field anymore for many reasons. There, there's a shortage of pilots, and it's getting worse. The, this industry overall, both the military and the commercial side, needs pilots, more pilots than ever before. So every single one of you who's watching this or who is on the call today, you would all be welcome in this community. You're needed. Um, I've worked in aviation and aerospace for my entire life, like Tejo was saying. And, and when I look at this and I wonder, well, what's happening? What I see with this pilot shortage is, is actually it's a mentorship shortage. It's a complicated career field. In many ways, it's overwhelming, uh, like Charles was talking about with higher education. It's tough for outsiders uh, to understand this career field and, and to understand how to get in. And there's a diversity gap here as well. Um, and that makes it even harder in many ways. For instance, women and, and people of color, they represent less than 10% of the professional pilot population overall. That's even when you include the military. Now, I'm the child of an immigrant family. I'm a second generation veteran. Uh, I'm a proud member of, of our citizen Potawatomi nation. Um, but, but if we were to go to this industry and, as early career pilots and we were gonna look for mentors and we were gonna look for inspiration and guidance and encouragement from people like us uh, who have walked in our shoes, what we would find would be a rounding error. Less than a half a percent of pilots are of native or indigenous descent. But this is a great place to work. I, I would not trade my job for the world. I, I love working in aviation. I mean, where else can you work where every single person who walks through the door has a story about a time that they looked up and they fell in love with their job? Uh, I would not trade any of this for the world. So it is worth it. So once again, I'm Paul Wins, and I co-founded this flight school that, that we've talked about before. I, I like to focus on minorities and veterans through my work in the flight school, and it's my pleasure to speak with you tonight about careers in aviation. Again, there has never been a better time to become a professional pilot, and that's whether you want to be a military or a civilian pilot. It is absolutely the best timing. It is a historically great time to get into this field. And why? Well, the numbers don't lie. Um, there has been this pilot shortage that's been going on for over a decade. It is beginning to really affect the industry. Um, here's a great quote from earlier this year with a major airline executive who was announcing that he had to cancel uh, service to 29 cities. And anybody who's traveled recently, especially over the summer, you've probably been impacted by this pilot shortage. And it's driven a lot by demographics. 50% of airline pilots have to retire in the next 10 years. And that's because there's a mandatory retirement age of 65 for uh, airline pilots. So who is gonna be this next generation 
of pilots. Of course, I hope it's going to be some of you. I hope it's going to be some of us from our community. Um, and and this talk and many more like it that I hope to give. And and you know anyone who would like to contact me directly, I would love to speak with you to uh, to help you understand how you could become uh, a member of this community. So we've already gone through the introductions. You know, I, I will say that 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 kind introduction I got earlier is a great way of saying I, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but I know I want it to be in aviation, so I'm going to do all the things. Um, but uh, that's enough about me. I, I'd really like to hear, um, Trey, from, from you and, and you as well, Julie, like what's your interest in aviation, whether it's for you, whether it's for students or other people that you know? Um, yeah, let, let's let's just kind of come off of mute, maybe even turn on the video if you're willing, and, and I'd love to hear from you. I, and Trey, why don't you go first, because I'd like to hear where you're at. In, in your oh, aviation journey. Please oh tell boy. me. Oh boy. Uh, nowhere further than from, from when we last talked, unfortunately. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, <clears throat> sorry if you just heard a little big sound that was my doorstop. Um, let's see here. I mean, I'm still super interested in it. Uh, the, the biggest thing for me is, is how do you pay for it? That's, that's mm. the struggle. Uh, and I think it would be easier for, for a younger person um, who doesn't already kind of have a, uh, you know, like an established career, a home, all that good stuff. I can't just pick up and leave and, and take on, a, a, you know, however much it costs to get through school. So that's the biggest roadblock for me. I don't know how you really, uh, I don't know how you cross, I, I, I don't know. I, I've had people say, you know, just, just bite the bullet and do it but boy is that a scary bullet to bite <laughs> yeah it's easy for them to say too right I yeah mean, it's not their living that's on the line yeah yeah and the other thing that that uh is super that, that adds another level of hesitation and doubt is the uh the medical just mm -hmm. because there there are some things in my history that i've been told would make it difficult to get a class one if I eventually wanted to make a career out of it. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the answers. I know it's something I'm interested in, but who is it a lot of money? <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's pieces of that that you could nibble away at to get the questions answer, answered like, you know, before you dive mm -hmm. in. And so that's something that I can follow up with you separately. I've also got a few words to say about the medical. Uh, mm -hmm. stuff towards the end. So, you know, all solvable problems, certainly from an answer, getting answers point of view. So you don't have to make the jump all at once, right? You can right. get the questions answered. And I'm happy to uh, to do that. And there's plenty of resources out there too um, that I could connect you with. But yeah, yeah thank absolutely. you for that. And I'd love, to, I'd love to dive into that here a little bit more later on. I, um, so thank you for that. Uh, Julie, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and, and, you know, if not you personally, Maybe you personally or people that you know or students that you work with. Um, what, what's your interest in aviation? Um, so I represent Gordon Cooper Technology Center, which is in the Shawnee area. Uh, and we uh, have a very good relationship with the CIS and Potawatomi Nation and had just seen the advertisement of this Zoom on social media and just was interested in seeing how aviation is of interest um, in other areas of our community. So uh, we have an aviation campus, uh, Gordon Cooper does, at the airport in Shawnee. We have an okay. uh, uh, AMP program. And so we have a high school session with students uh, from 31 partner schools. And then we also have uh, two uh, adult classes in session all the time with uh, three instructors. So uh, just that's that was just my interest in seeing how uh, it's growing and developing because a lot of things that you've mentioned already today are so true about trying to get people interested in uh, this. And, you know, in Oklahoma it is really a, a top uh, workforce need. And so uh, we recognize that and and always trying to learn just to see how we, maybe we need to uh, partner or evolve. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and I agree 100% with everything that you just said. Uh, and, and, you know, one thing I've noticed, and, and that's why discussions like this are so important, the, the larger players in this industry, the big airlines, the big government um, organizations, 
they, 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 their heart is in the right place. They have wonderful resources, but they at many times kind of scratch their heads and wonder, well, we told everybody that this was a great career field and, and they're welcome there. But I, I think what's often not understood is, is, you know, at the community level is, is where people get interested in this. And, and that's where, you know, you, uh, programs and, and pathways and, and, uh, and, and really great programming, uh, especially for high schoolers uh, and even middle schoolers really needs to, uh, to happen. So I, I'd love to help you, you know, figure that out uh, because there's so many resources that are out there and it's at the community level where, uh, where I think people are gonna get interested. Um, so yeah, well, thank you for that. And I, yeah, I'm sure, Taysha probably already knows this, but you know, we have high school partners um, in Shawnee, they have an um, aerospace program in their high school. Um, and so does Seminole Public Schools, which is one of our partner schools also has, are in their second year of having that hope, they're hoping to evolve into a four-year program for freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So I wanted to say that as well in case uh, uh, Tasha didn't know those details, because I think that's important. You know, they give those students um, exploration at our campus with the AMP program, but also they have students attending at their schools that are very interested in the, uh, being a pilot at some point in, you know, in their future. Well, that's fantastic. Well, maybe what I could do then here, you know, both both for for you, Julie, and and you know, Tasia, and everyone else who's on the call and and for the video is, um, I can lay out just what the pathway looks like at a very general, non technical level, just just you know, uh, a narrative level, just so folks can understand it, because that that's one of the biggest barriers that that I see is is you know, it, it's so hard to keep up. With, with all the different career fields. And there's a lot of counselors at the school levels that, you know, whether it's college or high school, that just aren't familiar with, with exactly what it takes because it's a, it's just a, it's a different career field with lots of commitments like Trey was, was mentioning and, and, you know, potentially large financial barriers. And so let me, let me talk about that. And hopefully, Julie, this will give you some insight and I would love to answer questions that you might have either here or, you know, later on, or even talk to folks that are in these programs that you were describing. Um, to uh, to help make sure that they get the information so they can um, get it to the kids who are interested. Well, great. Well, let me uh, let me move on to the next slide here, and we can start talking about this. So, what is this pilot pathway? Um, it is a unique career pathway that is very specific to aviation, and and there are lots of ways to get there. But I'll talk about two of the most common or three of the most common pathways that you can get into an aviation career as a pilot. And so the fastest way you can get there is in 24 months. And you start out as a student at a flight school and that takes about one year. And that's where you get a series of what, what are called ratings. Ratings are, are like certifications. They're the FAA, uh, FAA's way of, of saying that you are qualified to operate an aircraft in different ways. So in order, uh, that you get them. Um, first, you start with what's called a private pilot license, and this gives you the the privilege of operating an aircraft first as a student, and then in you know basic operations, daytime, good weather. Um, it's your first step in pilot training. Then there's what's called an instrument rating, which gives you the the rights to operate an aircraft, uh, the qualifications to operate an aircraft at night or in bad weather. Uh, then there's a commercial rating, which allows you to earn money as a pilot. And then finally, the most advanced uh, uh, in this first year is as a flight instructor, which allows you to teach other students how to fly. And so why do you want that flight instructor rating? Well, in year two, you're going to have to build your flight time up to 1500 hours before you're eligible for hire at an entry level as an airline pilot. During that second year, while you're teaching other students and you're building your time up to 1500 hours, you're also going to get an advanced rating, uh, a multi engine rating, which um, gives you the qualifications to operate an airplane with more than one engine, like a large commercial jetliner. Then after that second year, you're eligible for hire as an airline pilot, you can work as an airline pilot until your uh, mandatory retirement at age 65. Your lifetime earnings are, are going to be around $10 million or more in this STEM field. Um, so great compensation in this field. And realize, though, that you have that mandatory, mandatory retirement age. So 
every month that you delay cuts $30,000 from your lifetime earnings potential. So that means that there's a value to being fast in getting through your training. And you need to consider that depending on what your priorities are um, uh, as a career switcher or somebody who's at the very beginning of your career. No college diploma, this is a very important point. No college diploma is required to begin flight training or even to get hired uh, with your initial hire as an airline pilot. Is it a good idea to get a college degree? Absolutely. But you can do that on your own terms uh, after you've already been hired uh, and are pulling down that uh, significant amount of pay. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, that's the fastest route. Now, are you an aspiring military pilot? You don't need any training at all. Really, the military will take you without any prior flight experience. However, if you do want to get some experience on your own, I, I would recommend that. Uh, it's a great way for you to understand if aviation is for you and also to make yourself a little bit more competitive uh, in, in these military flight programs. The only thing you need is the private pilot license, which takes three to six months. And if you have this private pilot license before you enter military flight school, it allows you to skip or validate the first eight and a half weeks of Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, uh, or similar uh, military flight training. Now for most military flight programs, it does require that you have a college diploma before you can become, for instance, a Navy pilot or very similar for all of the other armed forces. These are very highly competitive programs and I'll have more on that uh, uh, later about how to make yourself more competitive for these programs. Uh, and that's, that's what I'll say about the military. First, let me um, talk about as well, college and flight training. A great way to get your flight training is to go to a four-year college or a two-year technical school that has an aviation program. And so how do these programs work? Well, for the four-year undergraduate um, uh, program, you'll go through the same flight training that you normally would that I was talking about with the fastest route, but it's interspersed with classes that you're taking over four years. And uh, in year four, you're going to have anywhere between 1,000 to 1,200 flight hours. But because you went through a college program, that's all you need to become an airline pilot. You don't need the 1,500 flight hours. You only need 1,000 to 1,200 if you've graduated from a collegiate, uh, either a four-year or a two-year um, college flight school program. So that means in, in year five, if you're going to a four-year college, you'll be eligible for hire as an airline pilot. And there are two-year and four-year college programs with flight schools all over the country. Um, uh, and there are plenty of really, really great programs. Um, Oklahoma has many, um, uh, as Julie was talking about. There are also plenty in Texas. Um, there are some resources you can use to, uh, to find some of the best of these programs in the nation. Um, you know, if you want to go to the Harvard of college flight schools, you'll probably be looking at University of North Dakota, um, Purdue and Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Now, military service is also an option. This is near and dear to my heart. I uh, went to the US Naval Academy and I went through the US Navy's flight training program. Um, my recommendation to you as someone who's walk the walk is that you're gonna have the most options uh, for military aviation if you, if you come in as what's called a commissioned officer, which means that you do need a college degree. You can get that college degree through going to a military service academy. So that's like West Point, the US Naval Academy, um, the Air Force Academy, um, or you could go to a civilian college and enroll in what's called the Reserve Officer Training uh, Corps, ROTC, where you get to be a civilian student, but you part-time train uh, for your military training. And then there's what's called Officer Candidate School or OCS. And with OCS, you already have a college degree and then you apply for direct commissioning as an officer in the military. So you could go directly in, into the military after college. All of these are very competitive programs. And there are ways to make yourself more competitive. You know, it is primarily GPA. Um, extracurricular activities are huge. Um, community work and community service are also very huge. Varsity sports uh, make you very competitive as well. These uh, military uh, commissioning routes are looking at you as, as the whole person. And, and so they really wanna see a lot more than academics there. But the main thing I wanna say here about this is make sure that you want to serve first and be a pilot second 
if you're going to join the military for many reasons, not the least of which is you're not guaranteed that you're going to be a pilot if you join the military. The needs of your military service, the Navy, the Army, whoever, um, are going to come first. And if they don't need pilots, but you've been commissioned as an officer, you're going to go where the military needs you to go. So make sure you're okay with that. Make sure that you want service first, and then flying would just be a bonus on top of that. A great route, though, if that's what you're interested in. So what is it like to be a pilot? What is this all about? Uh, well, you know, I could talk about it, and it's easy to get fixated on the technology. I mean, why wouldn't you be fascinated by jet planes? This is all it took for me at 18. And also, I saw this movie called Top Gun, and that was it. That was all she wrote for me. Um, but planes are just cool. Whether they're big or small, whether they're military or commercial, aircraft are, are the pinnacle of human knowledge and engineering and technical accomplishment. Um, and, and to this, you know, when, when I was a military flight instructor, I, I would ask people, I would ask students, hey, what do you think the most important system is in the aircraft? What's the most important technology? And people might say, well, it's the radar or it's the engines or it's this system or it's that system. But I want to challenge you by saying, I don't think it's that at all. I think the most important part of the aircraft is the crew, it's the people. And so if you take nothing else away from this talk about what it's like to be a pilot, I would say, remember that it's about teamwork. Everything you do as a pilot is part of a team from working with your co-pilot on the flight deck to working with the ground crew that helps you launch the aircraft safely every day. And we take air travel for granted. We take military aviation for granted. Um, it's routine. But the safety and the skill that goes into every flight uh, is like nothing else you'll see in any other career field. And, and so how do we accomplish that? How do we get this tremendous safety, this great safety record um, that everyone depends on? It all comes from teamwork. Aviation is about teamwork and nothing else. And so I'll leave you with that about what it's like to be a pilot. Um, so how do you succeed in this career field and especially in training? So the number one thing, um, that I recommend to folks is, is to make sure that you, you are resilient. And what do I mean by that? Not that you have grit and determination and you can, you know, you can grit things out. That's not it at all. Do you have, do you have a support community around you? Do you have family? Do you have friends? Do you have faith and community? Any mix of those things that, that, that brings you support and brings you joy. Do you have these, these around you? Because you're going to struggle as a, as a pilot, as an early trainee, Everyone fails at some point in flight training. Uh, Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon, uh, uh, a Navy pilot before he became uh, an astronaut. There's, there's a collection of his grade sheets when he was in flight school in the Naval Aviation Museum. And when you go and look at these grade sheets, there's a lot of his flights that are below average. A lot of flights where he was terrible at landings early on and a bunch of other fundamental skills every pilot is at the beginning. So you have to be ready for that. You're going to face failure. You need to be resilient and, and have a support structure in place to help you. Um, your study skills are definitely mandatory, but that doesn't mean like technical knowledge. You don't have to be an engineering or a technical or a math genius to succeed in this field. In fact, one of the most skilled pilots I've ever met and worked with was uh, the guy who was the, the leading student in my flight school class. He had the highest weapons grades, the highest flying grades, the highest bombing grades. He was a natural. Um, he went on to become uh, um, the senior military uh, pilot in the Navy who ran the training program for the most advanced uh, fighter plane in the Navy. And, you know, what was this guy's major in college? He was a physical therapy major. So you don't need to be a technical genius, but you do need really solid study skills, which comes down to, you know, these are teachable skills about how to study effectively um, and how to, how to have time management skills is really what a lot of this comes down to. So teachable skills that have nothing to do with flying the plane, those are your study skills that are going to serve you well. And then finally, you need a career plan. You need to understand how to get there, where you want to go, and be focused in your career goals and realistic about your career goals. And that may mean the financial side. That may mean um, you know, how much time you're willing to set aside for your training. You need to be clear on that before you begin, because once you begin, you're going to be so busy in the flight training that you're not going to have any time to wonder about your goals. And so I would encourage everybody who's interested in this, you, 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 need, you need somebody to work with who can help you set those goals and stick with them. And then the right stuff. Yeah, it's crossed out. That is, that is a myth. Maybe at the beginning of aviation 100 years ago, um, you needed the right stuff. You needed to be a solo, daring, rugged individual with a type A personality 
and, and an aggressive mindset. That is not the way now. What we need are team players, like I was saying before. So the right stuff, it's a myth. Um, it was a, it was for another age of aviation that we're not in now. So put that out of your mind. Okay, so challenges. Trey had mentioned a few of these. There are quite a few barriers to getting into this career field. The first is affordability. There's no two ways about it. Um, it is expensive to get into this career field. And if you are going to go through the civilian training, the commercial uh, pilot training, you're probably going to need a loan, which means that right off the bat, you need to be thinking about things and accessing resources that help you with things like your credit rating. Maybe you need a cosigner. Maybe you need scholarships. Maybe you need financial aid. You need to think about these things first, because unfortunately, they're a necessity for, uh, for flight training. The quality of training is something that you should think about. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, think about it in this way, at a very personal level. You're gonna be spending hundreds of hours in a plane with a flight instructor. Make sure that flight instructor is a good fit for you. Make sure that school is a good fit for you. So quality, you know, you can often get quality by going some, to some of the larger schools, especially the college programs, but make sure that the college itself has your priorities in mind. Do you wanna get there quickly? Or do you want to get there with less cost? Or is there something in between? Make sure you explore all of those things because quality means different things to different people. So think hard about that. Not all flight training programs are the same. And then finally, and this is the one that I strongly believe in, you need mentorship. Not only that, you need mentorship from somebody who is part of your community who matters to you because your flight instructor is, cannot be everything for you. That flight instructor is going to teach you the technicalities of how to fly the plane, but you need somebody who can help pick you up when you're down and who can support you and be a sounding board. And that could be somebody provided by the school. That could be somebody personally that you know, friends, family, somebody else who works in the field that you know, but make sure you have a mentor before you start on this journey because you're gonna need a guide. So I'll hit some frequently asked questions and then we'll go back over to questions and, and discussion. So frequently asked questions that I get. Um, uh, do you need 2020 vision? Do you need perfect vision? No, you don't. Um, not for commercial careers. You do need to pass an FAA, what's called a class one medical exam, which is a very specific and very rigorous medical exam. Um, and one way to understand if uh, you're eligible is just, just go take the exam. You, you don't have to be an active pilot to go sign up for an FAA class one medical. So we, at my flight school, we recommend that people do this immediately before they even commit to anything. Because if you have any surprises there, it's better to get those worked out and explored early before you've committed to the training. If even that is a little bit worrisome for you, because you know these exams go on your permanent FAA record, there are um, independent uh, medical examiners, uh, medical doctors who will do a uh, remote consultation for a small amount of money just to help walk you through the process so that you have an expert who's on your side um, who you can talk to. And if people are interested uh, in connecting with one of those uh, uh, experts for a consultation, I'd be happy to provide some resources. We have some trusted folks that we send uh, our students to at my flight school. Um, and then finally for the military with vision, yeah, you, you do need vision that is correctable to 2020. But again, it's a common myth. You don't need perfect eyesight to become a pilot at any uh, route. So how much is this gonna cost? It's a lot, uh, $80,000 for the shortest route. If you're talking about a four year college, then you're looking at upwards of $240,000 or more. Um, and this is a known barrier in this industry. Um, airlines have been working on it. Flight schools like mine have been working on it. There are lots of scholarship providers. There are lots of loan providers that, that make their loans as accessible as possible. Um, but at the end of the day, you probably are going to need a training loan unless you go to the military route. And then you're going to get the training for free, but you're going to pay for it, so to speak, in you know uh, anywhere between uh, uh, eight to 10 years of service. Um, and then you'll be able to transition to a civilian career or you can stay in the military. But just realize there are lots of commitments in this career, whether they're financial or whether they're service related. Speaking of, of veterans, are can you use your benefits for this training? Yes, you can. Um, you can use your GI Bill and VRNE for those veterans out there in the audience to cover the costs of this training. But you, you need to talk to your VA counselor because you cannot assume that your benefits are gonna cover 100% of the costs. There are some leftover, what are called out-of-pocket costs, and they vary widely depending on the school program that you select. So talk to an expert before you bet on having your GI Bill, for instance, cover all your costs. Now, the flip side of this though, 
is what's the pay equation, right? This is a very expensive career field to get into that has tremendous benefits. One of them is pay. You're going to pull down 90000 to just shy of $100,000 per year as an entry level first job in the airlines. And you could get there in as little as two years. So there's tremendous benefits to this. And then later on in your career, you're going to make $400,000 or more as a senior airline pilot in what's called a mainline airline. That's a big airline, like uh, like a United or a Delta uh, or, or one of those. Um, and also your lifestyle, your, you, when you're going to be scheduled to work, you know, when you're flying, you're flying. When you're off work, which is often one to two to sometimes even three weeks uh, off during the rest of the month, especially if you're a senior airline pilot and you have more control over your schedule, when you have time off, it's off. So I know many people who have a second career <laughs> as an airline pilot. I know lawyers that are also airline pilots. I know many people that have gone to college or graduate school while they've been an airline pilot because that's the return on this investment up front is you get a lot of flexibility in your schedule later on in your career and you have a lot of earnings potential. Like I was saying, in many cases, over $10 million of career earnings potential. So. That is, uh, you know, great compensation. Um, unfortunately, the barrier to entry at the beginning is high, but there are a lot of resources that you can tap into um, to help knock those down. And that is it for the prepared Q and A that I had. And so I would love to. I'm just going to stop the share here, and I would love to hear from uh, anybody else here. You know, Trey, Julie, uh, uh, even you know, Tasia, Charles, if, if you have anything else that that you know from your end, um, but questions, discussions, Let, let's hear it. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, you mentioned like after you get your ratings, you go um, uh, CFI, uh, uh, flight instructor route. Do you, what are your thoughts on, um, I know survey is a, what a lot of guys do. And mm -hmm. I think typically you can build your hours a little faster that way, but I know a lot of the, um, at least I think a lot of those companies make you sign like a one-year contract. So I don't know how that balances out in the end. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. And then on any of the other uh, time building options, I think there's, there's like banner towing, which I don't know how, maybe where you're at, that's maybe more, uh, more of an option. I don't know that there's much of that here. Uh, and then uh, I think that that's really all I know. I mean, I guess skydiving is another option, mm -hmm. but what, what are your thoughts on those? Yeah, th those are all great questions. So, so Trey, since you, you, you know, more than most, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap that question in a little bit of context. So, so everybody else understands the inside baseball here that's in your question. So, so the, so what, what, what Trey is talking about here is that you spend that first year getting all of your ratings now you need to time build. You have typically, by the time you get your um, uh, that commercial uh, uh, rating, which we talked about as one of the more advanced ones in year one, you're about 300 to 350 hours of flight time. You need to get to 1500. And so how do you get those roughly 1200 hours of experience? One way to do it um, is as a flight instructor, uh, and and the, you know that that way you can you can get those flight hours over the over the course of of a year to a year and a half. And so Trey, you have some other options that are great options. In general, <laughs> I'll summarize by saying this: those are all amazing options. But the amount of people that are in the market right now trying to get their pilot uh, aviation experience dwarfs the amount of those jobs, right? So banner tow, there's just a few available in any given location or city. Um, you know, even you even talked about it, right? Most of the banner tow is is out here on the West Coast, uh, you know, or or in tourist towns that have beaches, um, you know, maybe for sporting events, but there's not many of those particular jobs. Um, pipeline inspection was one thing that you had mentioned. Um, Civil Air Patrol is another way uh, that, that you can get uh, uh, that type of experience. Um, and uh, flying skydivers around. So you could be in a plane that is typically a, a twin engine plane, which is a great way to get lots and lots of multi-engine time. Um, you know, you take off, the skydivers jump out, you land, you rinse and repeat, and you spend, you know, an eight hour day doing nothing but taking off and landing and having skydivers jump out of your plane and have the time of their life. These are all great jobs. In general, I'll say you, you have to know a guy who knows a guy or know a gal who knows a gal in order to get these jobs because there's so few and far between. The 
the jobs that are always hiring are for flight instructors. And so that's why I recommend that as a route. There'll be some people, you know, maybe you or maybe somebody that you know that owns a plane, that owns a skydiving outfit, that, um, you know, has a banner tow operation or works for a oil company or a natural gas company or a construction company where those uh, pipeline inspection flights are available. Um, those are all great. You might even use them to supplement uh, your flight instruction. But in the way this market is right now, I would say the only dependable job where you always know somebody's going to be hiring you is going to be as a flight instructor. And the pay for these jobs, including flight instruction, is not much. It is, it yeah. is anywhere between 20 to 30 bucks per hour. Most of the value you're getting from that is in the flight time that you're building. And, and so that's why the industry is kind of set up like it is. So you want to spend as little time as possible during this, in this time build process, you want to get out of that. You want to pass through and go to the airline as quickly as possible. Right. Uh, I don't actually, I'm curious what your thoughts are on like, uh, I know some airlines have like almost like pathway programs, but I don't know that many of them actually offer any guarantee to a job or or a whole lot of anything but i want to say i heard that mesa just announced one where they are actually like they've bought planes and are like are they, are they paying like i think it's something like you, you have to you basically have to commit to go to them for x amount of years and while you're there you pay back the training i don't know if is, does that sound right to you does, is that anything you know about is that something you recommend yeah. So, so l let me talk to that. So in general, you know, the, the term for these programs that you're describing is, is what's called a cadet program, right? So as a trainee, you're a, you're a cadet for that airline. And what, what do you, the, the, they vary widely in what kind of privileges you have. They range from at the very high end, a program that United is running. That is, you know, if, if uh, Embry-Riddle is the Harvard of uh, you know college flight programs, then United Aviate is like the Harvard of of non college you know programs. It's a highly sought after program. United is a fantastic airline. Why does everyone want to go to United Aviate? Because you walk in the door. You you first of all you have to interview. You have to submit a a video interview and an essay. It's highly competitive. But once you get into United Aviate. Um, and they've made great commitments, like doing things like saying, hey, we want 50% of our incoming class to be uh, women. We want to disproportionately hire you know, people of color, uh, people from uh, underrepresented backgrounds. So their heart is in the right place. It's a great school. There's also a waiting list <laughs> to get in. Um, but in this cadet program with United, what do you get? You get employee benefits on day one. That's really nice. Uh, so you, you get access to like flight benefits and some of the perks that you would get. You get what's called a seniority number. So you're already building seniority even while you're training. And seniority is everything in the airline because when you get promoted to the higher pay brackets, that is all based on time and service in the airline. So the sooner you can pick up that, that uh, seniority number, the better. So United Aviate, that's why it's a great example of a great cadet program. And then, so how do you time build? They send you off to a network of flight schools uh, and then you go time build there. And then after that, they hire you at one of, one of their regional airlines. And then you have a guaranteed spot to move into United, um, but you don't have guaranteed timing. Um, so that is a pipeline and pipelines accelerate and slow down depending on their needs. But you're, you're, you are committed to that pipeline, like all cadet programs, you're committed to that particular airline if you choose that. So, um, so Trey, you had mentioned another very interesting one and things are changing very quickly. This one, they just made this announcement, Mesa Airlines, which is a smaller regional airline. They announced that, hey, we will hire you into our cadet program and then we will pay for you to get that 1200 hours of flight time, we're not even going to make you instruct. You're just going to join a flying club and, and you're just going to fly around and we'll cover the cost of the aircraft. You'll fly cross country training flights and other similar uh, training flights for 1200 hours over the course of a year. And that's how we'll pay for you to get the experience that you need. And, and Trey, this, this is a sign of just how competitive, you know, potential pilots like you would be invaluable to these airlines. They're now willing to come out and pay for a lot more of this that uh, wasn't paid for um, in the past. So, so you're right. You heard correctly that that is a new program with Mesa. 
Um, and then, so, so how does this fit in with the, with the bigger picture? These cadet programs, they offer you a certain amount of pay and a certain amount of benefits. Depending on how large they are, they can sometimes have a waiting list and they can be highly competitive to get into. You should definitely apply um, because they are a great place to, to uh, give your, your training structure and you don't get 100% guarantees that you'll get a job, but you do typically get a guaranteed interview, um, which when you look at an industry where every recruiter uh, routinely has thousands of applicants in their inbox, it's nice to get in through a separate channel where you get their attention first, and that's what you get out of cadet programs. But you don't need one to get hired. That's another very important thing. If you're in a hurry and a cadet program has a waiting list, you can still get hired at United um, by going to a flight school of your choice. You just need to make sure you have a good mentor who can connect you with the recruiters and help you navigate the process. Mm, right. Um, I don't know if you hit on it or not. Did you talk at all about uh, like part 61 versus 141? And like the, like I, I've always wondered, are the reduced minimums worth the typical extra cost of a 141 school? That, that is a great question. And, and that, and this is kind of, you know, more of the inside baseball, but again, since you, you've done more research than many, I'll kind of talk about that generally. And this will probably have to be the last question before we wrap up, but it's a great one. So there are two, there are generally two types of flight schools from a FAA regulations standpoint. And so this is independent. And, and so, yeah, I'll frame it this way. There are what are called Part 61 flight schools, and that Part 61 re refers to Part 61 of the Federal Aviation Regulations. Again, this is a very dense industry to get into. What do you need to know about Part 61? It means that these are typically smaller flight schools with very flexible uh, training programs that can, that can a lot of times save you money because they, they build the syllabus around your needs. Um, so Part 61, think a little bit lower cost, uh, and more flexible. Um, then the other one that Trey mentioned, Part 141, again, Part 141 of the Federal Aviation Regulations, Part 141 schools are highly structured. There are no opportunities to be flexible in the training. You have to go through the training from start to finish exactly in the order that it's been prescribed. And they are typically associated with college programs, which makes sense because college is a very structured environment. So part 141 flight schools are typically college. So Trey, you also mentioned reduced flight hour requirements. When I was talking about these two year and four year college flight programs, the, and they only need, you only need 1200 to 1000 hours of experience to get hired by an airline out of those programs. Those are typically uh, associated with part 141 schools. And so Trey, your question is a good one. Hey, I could go to a part 141 school and I only need a thousand to 1200 flight hours in order to then get hired by a, uh, an airline, you know, out of a flight school like that. But that part 141 school is a little bit more expensive. Um, so how do I make that trade off? Well, again, you know, it, Trey, there's no one right answer, right? You, you, you may want to get to an airline as quickly as possible, in which case you probably want to choose a Part 61 school, but choose a good one that has a very, very structured syllabus uh, and, and can commit to making you a priority for training. Um, and you'll pay a little bit less and you might get there uh, significantly faster. Um, or, you know, with a Part 141 school, um, you know, you, you uh, won't have to fly as much uh, during your time build process. Um, and you might even get uh, an easier chance getting loans and financial aid because it's attached to a large school that has like a federal aid, you know, student aid program. So these are all things that you need to look at. So, so if I were you and you're looking at like part 61, part 141, I would kind of set that to the side and look at the school first, right? Is it a quality school? Um, what is their time to train? Um, when you talk to their flight instructors, do they resonate with you? Do they have good loan programs? Do they have good access to good financial aid and scholarship programs? Ask these first and then, oh, by the way, if it's part 141 or part 61, who cares about that? They're both equivalent in the level of training that they do. Nobody can tell on your pilot license whether you went to a part 141 or part 61 school. That makes sense. Right. Cool. I think that's all, right. all I got. Thank you, Paul.
Wonderful. Thank you for those awesome questions. That that was like enough <laughs> questions for four people. So so that's perfect right there. <laughs> so so with that, uh, Tejia, I guess I'll I'll hand it over to you. Before that, you know, thank much everyone. It has been such a pleasure to connect with everyone. Um, I want to, you know, maybe I'll put it in the chat instead. Um, and let me share my screen just for one more minute to say, you know, hey, what is what are some next steps that that we can do here? So. You know, I don't even need to show it on the screen. So a great next step. If you want to take, uh, first of all, you need a mentor. Um, and, and my email address is paul at goflexair.com. Even if I'm not your mentor, maybe I can help you connect with someone. I, I, I would just love to connect anybody who's interested, help you get your questions answered, help you uh, understand resources um, that you could connect with to help you explore things. There's a great website here. Um, called pilotpipeline.com. And pilotpipeline.com is like Google for flight schools. It's run by veterans um, and I know the founders, it's a fantastic resource. Um, if uh, there is a subscription level of service, but there's also a free level of service. But if you're active duty or a veteran, you get access to everything for free. Um, so I would really encourage everyone to just go to Pilot Pipeline and check it out. It has these tools that you can do to play what if with your career and understand what it would take to get to different careers, uh, like a career builder type of a tool. And it also has a search utility where you can just look at flight schools that are near your local area and understand what they have to offer. Um, and, uh, uh, and just so you can understand what resources are available. Um, and then uh, also Pilot Pipeline has a uh, aviation scholarships uh, tool where you can find out if there's any scholarships that are available for you. Um, you do not have to be a member of uh, any of the organizations or any of the uh, you know, community affiliations for things like Women in Aviation International, Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, many, many more. There are all kinds of these organizations that offer scholarships. You don't have to be affiliated with that community. You just have to have a strong story and, and something that resonates in an essay or in a video application uh, so that they can understand why you would need that funding. So for aviation scholarships, I want to encourage uh, everyone to take a look at those. And again, contact me if you would like a free scholarships guide. Um, we have many of these available. They're up, updated monthly. And you can also use Pilot Pipeline to look at scholarships as well. And then finally, what's the first step? If you're ready, you want to go and do this, I would encourage everybody to get a private pilot license. Begin that training. And even if you don't go into an aviation career after that, you've accomplished something very tangible. And you're now a part of the aviation community once you get that license. And uh, it's a great initial way to uh, you know, take that first step, get yourself into a plane, learn what it's like. Um, and it's significantly less expense than, you know, the full career. So I would encourage everyone to look at that as well. And with that, Teja, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Ah, Jimmy Gwetch, Nigui and Paul for, the, for that wonderful information and just fantastic presentation. Really appreciate um, participation we had. This is going to be a wonderful resource that we will put on um, our tribal YouTube and share out on our social media. And of course, have posted on portal.podwatomy.org where we share, we post these kinds of um, uh, career or educational sessions. I did want to just give a moment, um, if if Julie, if you're interested to give just a you know a quick snapshot on if if a student here locally is interested in um, enrolling at Gordon Cooper in the flight program there, um, how they could learn more about that and connect with that program before we close. So Julie, if you if you'd like to, um, uh, I wanted to give you the floor for a moment. Well, I, I don't want to steal the thunder of everything that's been presented today. It's it's fantastic. Um, and, you know, uh, we currently don't graduate pilots. Uh, but so that's that's what made it interesting to listen to what Paul had to present today. And I encourage Trey. He is Trey. You are so knowledgeable and you are so interested and you already sound so dedicated. I hope I wish you all the best in your journey and your future pathway. You know, you have a goal. You obviously have identified a pathway you want to be a part of. And um, I believe that you believe that this is for you. So I hope I, I just wish you the best. Well, thank you. I have a question for Julie if she's go ahead. Do do you know if Gordon Cooper is ever planning to to have a flight program? 
That is a good question. Um, I, I, I wouldn't have any um, specific information. I, I can't say yes or no at this time. I, I am in my second year of being the superintendent at Gordon Cooper Technology Center. And so I am in the process of just gathering, gathering and gathering and gathering the needs of our community and, um, and of our region. And so this today is just one of those times to study and learn um, as much as possible so that future decisions um, are well uh, researched. Cool. Well, hopefully it happens. That'd be awesome. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate the conversation. I know um, that if you're watching this in, in as, as Paul said, in video lands, I think you, I hope you agree that this was useful and well, I know that I learned a lot and I have talked to both Paul and Trey and Julie extensively about the, these programs and I still learned a lot today. So that was absolutely wonderful. Um, so uh, if we, you know, some of you may already know, but if you don't, we, we invite you to join us for similar sessions in the future or to request a session if it's a field that you wanna learn more about. So we have done sessions on, um, you know, on graduate programs, we've done sessions on scholarships. We have one that we're in the works um, and planning for uh, medical school um preparation so if there's a field that you want to learn more about we are always happy to bring in an expert and it's it's just icing on the cake when that expert happens to be a citizen Potawatomi nation tribal citizen like paul so please join us for similar sessions in the future um if you are a Potawatomi student or um, alumni of our scholarship program we do have seasonal talking circles that we host virtually so we invite you to join us for those um, just it's, it's a way to connect with your fellow tribal citizens. We usually do some kind of cultural, short cultural presentation at the beginning because people want to learn about their tribe. So um, we just did the, um, the autumn talking circle a few weeks back, but we'll have a winter solstice talking circle you know, as close to the solstice as we can schedule it. So be on the lookout for more information on that. We, we post about it on our tribal Facebook page. We also send out emails to students and, you know, texts too. We try to get the word out in as many possible um, avenues as we can. But just again, uh, just a chi miigwech, just a many thanks for joining us today. And, um, you know, uh, bama pi. See you later. Miigwech. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Tasha. Bama pi. Thank you. Thank you. Miigwech. <laughs>